Good morning, church. How are we? We're second service people. Just saying. Hey, this is a rowdy bunch. Third service. We're normally leaving as you come in. No. Me and my wife and my kids, we are members of Cornerstone. This is our home church. But we are actually full-time missionaries. Uh, the movement our church is part of, we are full-time missionaries to Yale University. We've been there for 10 years. Uh, reaching the students of Yale. And sometimes I know it can be easy to ring fence colleges and say they're too hard, they're too whatever. But God has put in our heart and our call is to go into those colleges and to take the good news of Jesus because the people that graduate from college, they influence our lives every day. So we would rather be there being salt and light and truth that then when they graduate, they actually make a good difference in our lives. That's a good thing, isn't it? But this morning, I don't want to talk about that. I have the privilege of bringing the word this morning, as um, Pastor Randy said, Pastor Eric's away. And so I want to begin by talking to you about someone called Martin. So let me tell you about Martin. I came out of this room. I had been there for an hour, being interviewed. I turned the corner, and Martin was standing right there. And his first words to me were, not, hi, Rob, how you doing? He said, hey, what questions did they ask you? Now, I was a Christian. I sighed, and I thought, I really want to lie. That's my confession for this morning. Then I was like, well, maybe I'll just do half truth. I'll tell them some questions, not all questions. Now, before you judge me too badly, let me rewind. I had been in that room for an hour because me and Martin were up for a special award in our college. It was a prestigious award. We were both seniors, and it was going to be between the two of us. Once I told Martin all the questions, he then had time to go away and prep so that then when he went in for the exact same interview, he'd be ready for it. But here's the deal. This was not the first time Martin had acted like that. I had known Martin since we were both in freshman and first year. And this was always Martin. Martin was always about how he could get ahead, how he could advance himself. It was never a two-way street. It was always what Martin could take for you. And here we are at the end, right at the end of our college life together, and this moment happens. Spoiler, Martin got the prize. You ever faced a Martin in life? You ever faced that person you're like, Now, your Martin not be like my Martin, but we all have them. Let me give you another Martin. A Martin is that person at work who just always gets the promotion, who just seems to have the perfect spouse, the perfect kids. Their life is so Instagram curated. You're like, you're unreal. And what comes out of us is jealousy and envy because we wish we were like them. Or maybe the Martin in your life is... That family member who just is mean about you, mean about your job, mean about your life, mean about your past, mean about your future, mean about your spouse, mean about your kids, mean about your home, mean about your job. And you just want to be mean back to them because you know the buttons you can push to set them off. Here's the bad news. Martin doesn't need to be a person. Martin can be the circumstances of life. Martin can be that moment when you thought, I was guaranteed to get into that college, get that job, get that promotion, and you didn't. And what comes out is bitterness and anger. And sometimes Martin is just the fact that it seems like your life is unfair, that everyone seems to be doing better than you. And what then comes out is just a sense of bleakness and sadness, and this is how you live. You see, Martin comes in different forms. But we all face them, don't we? And like a glass on a table, when it's knocked, what spills out? What spills out are you and me in those moments? Is it anger, frustration? Is it criticism? Is it judgmentalism? Is it unforgiveness? Is it meanness? Is it jealousy? Don't you wish it could be a different way? 
Don't you wish it didn't have to be like that? Don't you wish you could maybe act differently from the way you've always reacted in these moments? It feels like this is the pattern, this is who I am, and this is how I react when this happens, when Martin comes to me. Well, here's the good news this morning. We don't have to live like that. We're going to see this morning at the start of James's letter how we can live differently. And it's simply by giving up trying to live the way we've always lived. And by stepping back and saying, I am weak. I want to be carnal. I want to be natural. Jesus, will you step in? Do in me and through me what I cannot do. Don't you wish it could be different? Don't you wish you could react differently to the way it always seems to be? Well, this morning we're going to spend a few minutes looking in James and what James says to us about how we can live differently from this. Because it doesn't have to be this way. So let's look at James. We're going to look at James 1, verses 1 through 12. James 1, verses 1 through 12. We're going to read it together. It's going to be on the screen. Because see, what James is telling us here is that we can live what I'm going to call a deeply formed life. A life that is so transformed by Jesus that we actually are almost surprised by how we go through the moments of life. That we don't seem to go through the way we thought we should or the way we always have. You see, Jesus wants to form something in us to deeply form his life in us that the fragrance of Jesus surrounds us. And not, can I be honest, the stink of how we've always done it. So let's read James 1, verses 1 through 12 together. It's going to be in the screen. This letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Drop the mic. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they're unstable in everything they do. Believers who are poor have something to boast about. For God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers and the little, fl- the little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. Here's the kicker. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Wow. Not holding back there, James, are you? So this is James's letter, his opening. So let's begin with prayer. Father, this morning as we come to these words, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit we will be transformed. You will form a deep life within us that we will not live the way we've always lived when we face the Martins of life. But Jesus, would you do something in us that we would be transformed? So we choose to surrender this time to you. We invite you in, Spirit of the living God, breath of God. Speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's James writing this letter, and he says, hey, a bond servant, a slave of of Jesus. But what we probably know is it's Jesus' brother. He's the biological son of Mary and Joseph. He doesn't make that claim, though. He walks in humility. And he says to the, to the 
12 tribes, the, the Jewish believers. But ultimately, this, way, this letter comes to all of us. So what James is saying applies to you and me today. And he goes straight in. He's like, hey, I've got some news for you. You're going to face trials all through your life. Thanks, James. Not really the way you want to open a letter. Because now I want to go, I'm just going to close this. I'm going to skip James. Because really, dude, draw us in. Woo us in. Don't be straight away with like, hey, you're going to have Martin upon Martin upon Martin upon Martin. Wow, thanks, James. But that's what he does. He says, look, you're going to face trials in life. My son, we were at a, a conference for our um, missionaries a couple of weeks ago, and he'd got a bracelet. I was like, dude, what does it say? Oh, dad, it says, um, nobody cares, get up, do it again. I'm like, wow, that's encouraging. That's really, nobody cares, get up and do it again. But James is kind of like, look, you're going to face trials. But see, here's the problem for you and me. Our, our world, world, our culture will tell us, no, 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 no. You don't have to. Keep it as safe as you can. And, and, and we try and minimize suffering and trial because they're bad things. And if we live like that, we're living with an illusion because it's not real world. I had the joy of celebrating my 50th birthday last month. I have traveled 50 times around the sun. And I'm going to tell you, I meet Martins every year, multiple times in the year. I have trials. Some are small and some are big. So one of the first things James is telling us is, be disillusioned with the fact that you will somehow escape trial in life. Burst that bubble. You're going to face trials. You're going to face things in life. Isn't that encouraging? You're welcome. Should I just leave? <laughs> Some of you are like, yes, please. We've had enough of you. But that's how he starts. But here's what's interesting. When you read James... He says something really interesting. He basically intimates that many of these trials you didn't choose. Now, there are trials in life and I'm like, yeah, I brought this on myself. There are many times in life I'm like, who is it to blame for this? Me. And those ones, I don't like them, but I'm like, it's my fault. I did this to myself. But what James intimates to us is this. There are many times you're like, where did that come from? Wait, what? This was not me. And that's the ones we really struggle with because what? They're unfair. And again, our culture promotes a world that somehow life is fair. 50 times around the sun. I'm still waiting for life to be fair. <laughs> still not happening. So James is saying, look, there'll be many things you'll face in life, many trials, many testings, and it will seem unfair because you did not invite it. Martin will come from the front, from the side, from behind, and he's just going to be in your life. So you're like, okay, thanks, James. What a great opening to your letter. You're telling me I'm going to face trials, and many of them are going to be, in a sense, unfair, difficult, hard things to go through. And then Martin says, oh, Martin, <laughs> I've got Martin on the brain there. And then James says these words, consider it all joy. What? What? <laughs> you are really not good at this letter writing, James. You've just told me I'm going to face trials, and then you say, consider it all joy. Let's read it. Greetings, dear brothers and sisters. Oops, I've skipped. Yeah. When trouble of any kind comes your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. No, I do not want to consider it. Do I like have an emergency tambourine in a case that I smash in times of trial? I take out my tambourine, I just put on a fake smile and, you know, start praise God. Yes. One person in the room likes me. And I'm shallow enough that I'll take it. But that's not what James is saying here. And we've got to give James space. He's not saying, look, don't, be this, don't have this illusion that somehow you either will not face trials or you should put on this fake, fake life when you go through them. That's deceit or self-deceit. 
So we've got to listen to James's words. So what does he say? He says, look, here's what's going to happen in life. You're going to face the Martins. And you have two ways you can walk. One way is you walk the way you learned from a kid. You learned it in your home. You learned it in your community. And it's how you respond to the events of life. And he says, you can respond that way. And this tends to be the way of unforgiveness, of jealousy, of envy, of a whole bunch of stuff that Jesus doesn't want in our life that can lead to anxiety and stress upon us. And James says, basically, you can walk this way because that's the way you grew up. Or there's an alternative. If you walk this way, and this is the way where you say, God, this moment is really hard. This person is really hard. This situation is really hard. And I want to walk this way because it's what I know. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to confess that I am weak. I'm going to fe- confess that I am full of me and my sin and my carnality and my flesh and the old me. And Jesus I need you to step in. I need you to take this. Because if I walk through this the way I've always walked through it, when it happens again and again and again, I'm always going to be the same person. And it's always going to trouble me and hinder me and, and just do X, Y, and Z to me. But if I let you in, you can begin to change me. This circumstance may not change. Martin may still be right there. But I will be different because of you and me. Will you do that for me, Jesus? And do you know what that can result in? Joy. It results in joy. Because when Jesus comes in and I suddenly maybe have hope that it can be different or I can move in forgiveness for the individual or I can not be jealous and envious, suddenly that, that weight is lifted from me and I'm like, that feels good. I feel joy. And I know that the next time something comes along that's very similar to this, God's going to walk me through it. And that gives me joy. Joy is the product of the surrender. So when James says, look, people, you're going to face these situations in life, consider it joy. Because if you let God do something in your life to deeply form a new life in you, you'll walk through this time differently. You'll walk through the next time differently. Now, sometimes there'll be two steps forward and one steps back. Sometimes there'll be one step forward and three steps back. But the hope we have is that it will be different because of Jesus. Amen? The problem we face is what I like to call the Kelly Clarkson theology. And it goes something like this. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. How many of you now got that song in your head? You singing it right now? I bet you are. But if you know it, you're now, oh, I've got that song in my head. I call that the Kelly Clarkson theology. It's a terrible theology. Because what she basically says is, I can do this. I can get through this. I can be the person. It's positivity. It's self. It lasts about three minutes. And then we start to walk down this path again. Bitterness, anger, whatever it might be. It won't last it requires the steps of surrender to Jesus to allow him in to see a, a life that's deeply formed and changed forever. And that brings us joy, amen. So James begins with this. And I think about Martin in my own life. When I first knew Martin, I was not a Christian. I became a Christian in my sophomore year of college. So my first year, when Martin was mean, I was mean. When Martin tried to criticize, I criticized harder back. I pulled him down. I gossiped about him. I was mean to him and I was mean about him. Because all I knew was the path I'd always walked. But then in my sophomore year, Jesus crashes into my life, begins to take the reins. Now, this did not happen overnight because discipleship is a slow, long process. Eugene Peterson has a great phrase. It's called a long obedience in the same direction. And it took a long time. But Jesus began to change me. And at first I didn't like it because I liked this path. But then a new path came in and Jesus began to, uh, 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 
not in a religious way, but he began to change my heart towards Martin. And I began to be kind. And I began to be self-controlled with my tongue. Hello. And I began to move in love and kindness towards him and forgiveness. You see, that was a deeply formed life. And that took the burden off my shoulder. And I realized, man, I don't need to compete with you, man. My identity, my value, my worth ain't in competing with you. It's found in Jesus. Now, sometimes that was two steps forward. Sometimes it was one step back. But the path was there. And I had joy because I wasn't trying to be the old me with him. But it required me taking the steps of weakness, surrender, and inviting Jesus in to fill the space. So the first thing we hear is, hey, you're going to face Martins all your life. How are you going to walk with them? Oh, well, you could do it your way, Jesus. Yeah, you'll get joy that way. But the point is, you're still like, but, but how, do, how do I do this? And it's like, James is ready for us. He's like, I know what you're going to ask me. How? How do you walk this path? And he says it in verses five through eight. He says, with wisdom. If you need wisdom, ask a generous God and he'll give it to you. He'll not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they're unstable in everything they do. You see, James is ready. You're like, okay, right, you want me to walk this way. How? How do I walk this way? And he says, you need wisdom. I'm like, is that it? And here's the reality. Yeah, that's all you need. That's all we need is wisdom. But he gives us a caution. There's two wisdoms. There's God's wisdom and the world's wisdom. You got to pick one. You can't live with both. You can't. And you're like, I don't listen to any worldly wisdom. Is that right? Is that right, people? Every movie we watch is trying to teach us how to live our life. That's called wisdom. It's not godly wisdom, but it's a form of wisdom. Every TV show we watch will try and teach us how to live. It's a form of wisdom. Oh my goodness, every Instagram meme, story, whatever it might be on the gram, is trying to teach us wisdom. TikTok's in a whole different league when it comes to that. But they're all trying to teach us how to live. So none of us can say, I don't listen to any wisdom from the world. It seeps in all the time, doesn't it? And James is saying, you got a choice. You can't live with both. Because the alternative is godly wisdom. What's godly wisdom? Godly wisdom is scripture. I'm sorry, it's as simple as that. Reading scripture, praying, seeking godly friends to speak to the Martin moment. That's godly wisdom. And James says, you got to choose one. Because see, when you try and do both, he uses this great description, you're like a wave. There's nothing solid. And I know in my own life, and I see it in people around me, when they try and go between two different wisdoms, they flip-flop, they do one thing, then they do the other. It just ends up in a mess. There's never, it's never good. So James says, look, you got to choose one or the other. Choose wisdom. If you want to walk through this moment, choose wisdom. And when I think about Martin in my own life, I could see that. I still had friends who didn't know Jesus. And please, can I encourage you, have friends who don't know Jesus. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. In fact, he probably had more people who didn't, friends in his life who didn't know God than any other. So I had friends who didn't know Jesus. And the wisdom they gave me was not good wisdom. They were telling me what to say and do to Martin. I'm like, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's really good. But it sounded good. And I wanted to slide that way. Because the natural self finds that really easy. That's not hard. I can do that without thinking. But through scripture, through prayer, through speaking to godly friends, they, they were taking me a hard way. A way I didn't want to go. But it required admitting my weakness surrendering to Jesus and inviting him in. And when I did that, 
That's the only time I found freedom. That's when I found I could breathe. And anxiety and stress and all the negative things began to go off my shoulders. Not because of Kelly Clarkson theology, because of surrender to Jesus. But I had a choice. Who would I listen to when it came to wisdom? Right at the end of this letter, or this introduction to the letter, James suddenly seems to pivot to richness. And you're like, dude, again, like, do you know how to write a letter, man? I mean, what's with this randomness? You you tell us, first of all, we're going to face trials all all our life. That was really encouraging. And then you tell us, do it with joy. And I'm like, what? And then you tell me I need wisdom. I'm like, okay, that makes sense, at least. And then you're saying, hey, what about rich people? Well, where are you going? But you see, it's like James brings us our first Martin. He introduces the first Martin. Because you know what? For us, we like money. We talk about it a lot. And money in and of itself is neutral. It's not a bad thing. It's just neutral. But when we raise up here, there's the idol. We were just in Scotland, best small country in the world, um, for a vacation. We took our kids. They're 14 and 11. The last time they were there, it's 10 years ago. They, so they had no comprehension. It was, it was funny before we left. Both my kids were like, yeah, we'll understand everybody. No. I texted one of our staff team. And the second day there, I said, day number one, Rob still had Americanized Scottish accent. Day number two, completely gone. My daughter was like, what, wor- what words are you saying? I do not understand your words. But my daughter in particular, she loves, she loves the idea of nice things. So we went to London for a couple of days and we went to Harrods. Have you ever been to Harrods? It's like a whole other world as a store. But we just wanted to walk through because that's all we could afford to do was walk through, right? No, no, we bought chocolates. And I'm like, how much did we just pay for those chocolates? No one can eat the chocolates. Just look at the chocolates. (laughs) Put them on a shelf. Let people know we bought those at Harrods. But um, my daughter's like, Dad, can you take me into Prada? And she's 11. She's like, oh, there's Christian Dior. And they said, there's Louis Vuitton. I'm like, how do you know how that word goes? Where are you learning these words? I'm like, I will take you through. You will touch nothing. I will touch nothing. Look like we belong here, okay? <laughs> do you see the price of that? that? But the point being, we all love money. We all love richness. And so James straight away says, hey, what about richness? Now that richness can be material richness. It can be someone who is rich in friends and you're envious of them. It can be richness in that Instagram perfect family and you wish you were them. But the point James is making is, see, here's the first one. When that glass is knocked, what spills out of you when it comes to richness? Is it envy? Is it jealousy? Is it a desire to be alongside them? Because James says, because that's all going to fade, people. It's all going to disappear. He's making a point. How are you going to live in those moments? So what's going to come out of you at that time? So James is saying, look, (sighs) Martins are going to come at you all your days, from the front, from the back, from the side. And there might be people, there might be circumstances, but how are you going to walk through them? Some will come upon you and you're like, where did that come from? But he says, so here's the deal. You're going to have to learn to seek godly wisdom because that is what will lead you through all these moments. And as you are changed in those moments, you will know joy because you'll know you don't have to be the person you were. And oh my goodness, who is the person that you're becoming? But remember, this is not self-improvement. This is not Kelly Clarkson theology. This is not about making you a better you. It's about admitting weakness and surrender so that the King of Kings can form himself in you. Because when he is glorified in us and his fragrance is upon us, the world notices 
and the world is attracted to him. And that is what it's all about. I love what Eugene Peterson says. It's not a translation of scripture in the message, it's called an interpretation. But listen to what he says in verses two through four. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. I'm going to ask us to close our eyes now and bow our heads. And I'm going to ask us to think about Maybe the Lord has spoken to you already, a situation you've walked through recently, or maybe you're in right now, where it's your Martin. But can I also say, it's got to be in your future either way. But we're going to close our eyes, and we're going to pray, Jesus, we invite you into this moment. Maybe something we've walked through, or something we're walking through right now, but we invite you in. And we invite you in to speak to us in this moment. God, help us to know that no matter how badly we maybe walk through it, you forgive and redeem when we come to you. So Lord, for every person who's maybe faced a situation recently or is in one right now, but will face one in the future, Father, I pray that you would invite them into a place of admitting weakness, of being a person of surrender to you, that Jesus, you can come in and you can deeply form us to be like you so that when the next moment comes and the moment after that we would have joy because we know you are in this moment so for every person in this place father i pray that you'd be the god of hope peace joy love forgiveness you would be the god of new beginnings of redemption and you'd be the God that delights to make our soul new, that we might reflect you, Jesus. So help us all to surrender and to follow you as we walk through the circumstances of life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.